Yes. That's all. Start it. Hello. Yeah. We have all the show notes. It's not scripted. Okay, Giuseppe, you can take it away. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion with five friends about future trends, technology, and their implication for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. Why don't you guys give an introduction about yourself? I'm Michael Curry, an independent software developer and entrepreneur from Canada, currently living in Thailand. I'm Daniel Valenzuela, a mathematician and social impact enthusiast currently based in Munich, Germany. I'm Parnian, an entrepreneur who's interested in decentralized organization and building a global brain. Currently, I'm living in California and I'm from Iran. I'm Giuseppe, a computational scientist. I'm based in Boston and I'm interested in modeling materials for renewable energy, specifically in materials that can convert heat into electricity. I'm Hossein Kuhani, a technopreneur working on biomedical devices and cyborg technologies. I'm from Iran and currently live in Michigan. So here's the format of our show. We'll first talk about the latest future-related news. Then we'll discuss a particular future-oriented topic for about 30 minutes. The final 10 minutes are reserved for an elevator pitch battle. Let's get started. All right, Haas, do you want to give your news item? All right. Considering refugee camps and how technology can help, there's new company and new platform that started in just last year, Settle In. Settle In is a platform that helps refugees to get connected and merge through the society and getting information from anything they need, from shelter, from food, from education and skills that they can get, internships that they can find, and anything about healthcare and medication. Settling started in September 2016. They launched their website, and through their website, you can connect through so many different organizations and groups that they help and give services for refugees. Settling is a landmark for how technology and social media can transform the lives of refugees in new countries. Sweden is right now a pioneer in this field, and they're working to how technology is helping out refugees that are impacted by the war zone. That's really cool. I'm surprised there aren't more organizations doing this. I mean, I'm sure there are, but this one is special because it's based on, it's like a startup, so it has a mobile app or something. Yeah, they started like a uh, website, it's a platform, and it connects it to a lot of different services and organizations. They have their own, each have their own applications. So for example, you go through the healthcare part and it connects you to the organization called Doctors of the World. And this it is an app called Clinic Finder. The Clinic Finder is a mobile web app which is provided by Doctors of the World UK designed to provide simple and clear information about free primary health care and medical services for refugees and migrants across Europe. So it uses your phone's GPS location to show on map the nearest free health clinics and what services can be accessed. It also allows you to search by location and by specific service required, while language options currently include English, Arabic, Farsi, and French. Yeah, the language thing, I think, would be huge because from what I've read, that's kind of obvious. It's one of the biggest barriers to integrating when you're in a country. In Canada, for example, there are lots of Syrian refugees and many of them, of course, don't speak English. And so they need sponsors who are Canadians to help them, to help guide them through society and, you know, getting very basic things out of the Canadian government and finding schools for their kids and imagine how great it would be if they had an app like this one, I guess, that could point them to all these things in their native language so it wasn't quite so intimidating. There is actually, I, I once saw, I think it was called Visa Bot or something, like a chat bot for, for like visa related and law related issues foreigners might have or like refugees might have to enter the US. I thought that was pretty. Yeah, my only, my only concern is about how service provider can connect to this app. For example, if there are two service providers that can provide a some service with different features, how can they compete with each other or they get their on board at the same time? And so I just want to, uh, to make a point here that I'm not, I don't want to bring television to you. And so I think that having a rated system could be very important that user service can raise the system. So at the end, just the best system the best system and service can be used instead of having a service that just pour the more money into into the app in order to have higher visibility. So I'm just trying to uh, 
uh, give a perspective of what happens from the other side. One of the idea I do have also, like it would be great if we can build a graph that can recognize those, uh, for example, Syrian refugees, and then based on that connect uh, any single things that is related to them based on their location. And then if you see similar people, then you can figure out like what types of information they have. And I can connect. Yeah. Sorry, Parney, your point sounds great, but we just, it, it keeps cutting out. Sorry, you guys, you talk. So I'm not sure how long Parney's going to be because she's next. So uh, maybe anybody else have some thoughts about the app, the house brought up. Do refugees have cell phones? I think they do, right? That's one of the basic things that everybody seems to have these days, no matter how yeah, that's badly also, off you are. That's also something people in Germany, like it was so weird when suddenly a lot of refugees came here. Everybody was criticizing, oh, they have smartphones. They can't be, you know, in such a bad position, <laughs> which is completely unrelated to the situation they're having at home. My opinion. So most of them actually have smartphones because they also want to be in contact, stay in contact with family. So that's a very important item for them. But do they have a good infrastructure in their home country? I'm just worried about this. Well, I guess the purpose of this app is to help people who have immigrated to different countries where presumably the infrastructure is better. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone there. So oh, okay. Okay. because it's orienting refugees to their new country. Yeah, so when I was in Bonn, I was actually supporting refugee camps to equip them with Wi-Fi because, I don't know, Germany is one of the worst countries in terms of Wi-Fi or, or internet providers in general. But yeah, it's, I think it's one of the most important things which people actually don't see as a right for them to, or, or don't, don't want to like primarily, or usually don't want to invest in, in internet provision for them. That's a really good point. It does seem like that these days having a cell phone is is sort of something that needs to be considered not a right, but a very basic good that is needed for almost anything. If you need to have access to like the banking system or to get a job, you absolutely need a cell phone to be able to connect with people. So yeah, I mean, if you don't have a cell phone, you can't participate in the modern economy the way that you would need to, to become a success, to, to successfully integrate into a new society. Yeah, let's say, for example, like you're there and you settle like your papers and your shelter and you got food. But the next thing you want to find a job. So how do you do that? You want to use LinkedIn, right? So how can you use LinkedIn? You need a cell phone. And then on the on the other side of it, once you're set, I think like there are a lot of basic infrastructure that already are there to address similar inquiries, similar needs for the citizens. But the only thing they need is to specialize and have initiations specialized for refugees. For example, LinkedIn uh, recently launched this uh, initiative, which aims to create a platform where newly arrived refugees located in Sweden as part of uh, the settling project. And they, they can meet employers and have fairs and, and that they can specialize, they, they're specialized for the people, for the refugees. So I guess these kind of, adjustments to the already existing infrastructure is something um, which is uh, pretty much working, I think. Another problem is accommodation. And I heard that there, there have been some initiative from popular home sharing services uh, to provide accommodation to refugees. And this, I think, should be connected to some government level services. For example, I am for example, if you're like, if you're from a government, we can get, we can give money to potential host in order to accommodate refugees. And I think this could be a game changing. And I think Airbnb has thought about that already, but without a government incentive. So, but I see your point. So we need something that is already there and established and has to be with a, an extension to uh, helping refugees. The real tragedy here is that we're coming up with all kinds of great ideas. Airbnb for refugees sounds fantastic. The business that Haas was introducing also sounds great, but these are all predicated on the idea of refugees coming over to developed countries that are not conflict torn. And most of the time, the issue is they're even getting to that point. They're blocked by the physical danger of getting over there of making the trip. They're also blocked by laws that say that 
you're not allowed to come to our country if you're a refugee. And so it seems like we're fighting to help these people. We're, we're, we're trying to help refugees, but we're being blocked by laws and rules that really keep us from helping the people that are most in need. Now, the question of whether or not it's good to bring refugees into a country, I think is way beyond the scope of this conversation. But I think it's worth pointing out that we're sort of cleaning up and helping at the margins, whereas the main story, I think, still seems to be in the original country where these conflicts are taking place. And so I wonder if we're sort of, again, taking the easy cases here by focusing on how to help the refugees that have arrived in safe countries. What about the people that are left in these conflict zones, wherever it is in the world? And so I wonder if we could move the conversation to talk about that. Today's topic is the role entrepreneurs and technology can play in wars and situations of global unrest. The Syrian civil war is the deadliest conflict the 21st century has witnessed thus far. To quote at length Al Jazeera, as the Syrian conflict enters its seventh year, more than 465,000 Syrians have been killed in the fighting, more than a million injured, and over 12 million Syrians, half the country's pre-war population, have been displaced from their homes. Initially, lack of freedoms and economic woes fueled resentment of the Syrian government and public anger was inflamed by the harsh crackdown on protesters. Successful uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt energized and gave hope to Syrian pro-democracy activists. Many Islamist movements were also strongly opposed to Syrian dictator Bashar Assad's rule. Although the initial protests in 2011 were mostly non-sectarian, armed conflict led to the emergence of starker sectarian divisions. Minority religious groups tend to support the Assad government, while the overwhelming majority of opposition fighters are Sunni Muslims. Most Syrians are Sunni Muslims, but Syria's security establishment has long been dominated by members of the Alawite sect, of which Assad is a member. As conflicts like the Syrian one we just described rage, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, the kind that we like to talk about on this podcast, have tended to focus on solving problems closer to home. While the world's best minds are busy building apps for sharing pictures of food and cats, the world's most pressing issues seem not to draw much attention from innovators and investors. Here are some of the Y Combinator finalist ideas, guys. 3D game authoring tool, Kerrig, you know those K-cups for coffee? So Kerrig for smoothies. Office management commerce platform, voice analytics for sales calls, and automated genetic counseling. What moral obligation do the world's innovators and investors have to help the most vulnerable? And what opportunities for making the world a better place might exist if we expand our perspective to include the people of Syria and other conflict zones? So I was thinking, uh, following up with Michael's uh, point, I think when refugees are settled in the host country, the most important thing that affects all businesses, all ideas and all innovations usually is around matchmaking. Matchmaking talents that people can have deals, they can have tradings between their skills and they can have tradings between the values that they can offer to the host country and they can benefit it from host country. So when I go through all the businesses through the website Settle In in Sweden, I see most of it is all concentrated in this concept. For example, there is this um, another website that is linked from the settlement website. Its organization is called Refugees Welcome. Their website is refugees-welcome.se. When you go through that, you can see that their first main page is addressing the problem of housing and on a very open source platform. Uh, you can go and register a room of your house to host a refugee so that they can diffuse the refugees across the town, across the city, so they don't get centralized in a refugee camp. So the housing that can spread the refugees across the city so they can merge to the culture and live 
with the locals. So you can go register your house or you can be a client looking for a house. So this is the main page of this website. And they also have another part that gives directions to find employers and connect businesses. And it's interesting. This is a very interesting part that when they are addressing who can apply, here are the items. First is that you have a degree in engineering, science, or business finance. You have proficient English language skills. And then the third one is you are an asylum seeker at Migrations Worket, which is a website, an official website of the government in Sweden. And you're a newcomer academic registered at Arbets for Mindelen, which is another website in Sweden that you go and register your name. So two items out of four, it actually what it's doing great psychological impact is that it is legitimizing the situation that those minority refugees are at. I think it's a really big concept to give the feeling of that you are legit. The state you are at, we officialize it and we accept it and we work around it and the services are targeted for them. I think it is really helpful for refugees. I think those are all cool ideas and there's certainly many of them also in Germany, like job boards for refugees and like also this improved integration by mixing them together with locals. And the thing is that this is already again in the safe countries. So what if we could maybe learn from that and try to bring that more in or, or closer to the critical zones? But it's always for us, you know, like being here a safe place. I think there's no way we can actually imagine what it's like there and what their real problems, you know, or like what actually would help them. So it's really hard to talk about it and everything we come up with might be complete uh, bullshit in the end. But if we could, I don't know, like implement similar ideas very close to there, for example, refugee shelters, which are boarding to the critical zones, for example, we could or one could ensure the safety there for one and also have like kind of an accelerator program there where, where you can enable the refugees who are still kind of close to their home to gather their ideas to learn from them on what to do about uh, there and and let them also develop so that's i think that's a kind of good idea also i would like to add that the real problem in those areas is the lack of internet infrastructure it's very hard to have them coordinate themselves coordinate the humanitarian heart so it's it, it's really crucial to get satellite level communication. I just look it up what is the most like the smallest and hopefully also the cheapest. Okay, sometimes they don't go together. So I just look it up the smallest satellite phone and it it is seriously it can really go in your on your hand. So you can use it you can use it very easily, but it costs one thousand dollars. So I think that the development of satellite based technology can really help the innovation or at least the relief that those people need so much right now unfortunately for example the uh for example for the half sub-saharan region in africa a satellite system was planned by facebook actually but unfortunately the elon musk spacex rocket went on fire as you remember a few months ago and but i really hope that initiatives like those will uh, be even more will be flourish and will be uh, even more frequent in the near future. So once we have the inter infrastructure about the internet, once we have the internet infrastructure, we can really connect with those people and we can really bring innovation because right now most of the innovation is brought through the internet. So that backend has to be fixed first. But Giuseppe, isn't that again in that Silicon Valley mindset where we're thinking in this box that all innovation takes place on the internet that we're going to improve these refugees or these people in conflict zones, their ability to submit pictures of their cats online or something like, sorry, I don't mean to, to trivialize your point. Of course, the internet gives people access to a lot more than just pictures of cats, but they're farther down the hierarchy of needs than just the needing to connect to the internet, aren't they? I mean, it seems to me like water, power, food, security these very very basic things seem like things that people in in the worst parts of the world need this is kind of the point i think is aren't entrepreneurs letting these people down like these are the best minds in the world and we're everyone's minds are focused on the internet everyone's minds are focused on these like abstract ideas but they're forgetting that not everyone on the planet has reached the point where we can 
use the internet to make our lives better. Some of these people are in their huts worried that the gang over there is going to come in and rape their women. Like they're worried that they don't have enough food to eat the next day. Like the internet's not going to help them for this stuff. Or maybe I'm missing something. You're right. It's not the whole thing. But once you have that background, we can, we can totally help each other. For example, let's say a new food center is in that time and that place. How can those people know about it? They can just pull up their map and they can go to those qualified food dispenser, right? Instead of chasing a random track and then maybe, you know what happens today, I guess, from yesterday, a random track that was supposed to bring food, just a kamikaze. So internet can help, can totally help uh, to connect qualified food dispensers to those people. And this is one example, for example. You're totally right. We need to do it on different levels. And this maybe this just fix one of the problem or half of the problem. You always have to think you can't just approach this with an utopian view of the internet. I agree there with Michael. You always need to think, well, what will they do with it? And how might it be abused? Because very often, actually, it will be abused instead of used for a good thing. And that internet, particularly social networks, just due to in efficient information transfers, can be very, very valuable outside to, to um, communicate among yourselves. So I generally think it will be a good idea to have internet there, but you need to ensure that it's going to be used for the right thing. What do you think about the idea I said earlier about implementing kind of accelerator programs close to the war zone, like at the maybe first or second refugee camp? Do you think this might be something which might be interesting? I think in terms of the people who are there and what they know, it will be probably much more useful, the, the ideas which pop out there. But in terms of shock, maybe people are still traumatized. Do you think they will even care for this? Because it will still be something which will help their home country and help them to go back potentially, but I don't know. What do you think? That's an intriguing idea. I certainly agree that asking people that are close to the situation, the actual people that would be consumers of the technology would make the innovations more likely to be correct. This is the lesson that I have to keep learning myself. And this is what I keep reading is that the most important thing is to get out there and test with real users. And so having an accelerator close to a conflict zone would certainly come up with much better ideas than, unfortunately, the five of us in our relatively comfortable surroundings. So my idea also I do have is that um, if we can resolve those also with the other types of network connectivity, for example, cell phone text or... Um, Tiny, audio, sorry. audio quality is terrible. Could you try to maybe, I don't know... Can you hear me better now? Out in, ...in your microphone or something? It's an internet problem, mm -hmm. kind of. It does seem like decentralized technologies help to dilute the power of the state, and they also help people who are in vulnerable situations that don't have access to infrastructure that would normally be there in a developed country. So if you have a solar panel that charges your cell phone, and that cell phone is connected to satellite internet, then the solar power part is decentralized, and certainly that would help you to have access to information independent of any power grid or some sort of state actor needing to maintain the power infrastructure. In the same way, if you have a way to desalinate water or otherwise purify water, if you have a way to 3D print weaponry so that you can defend yourself, it seems to me like innovations along those lines are also going to help people disproportionately in conflict zones because those are the very people that are literally decentralized. There is no center because the state is in a state of distress. Yes, I agree with your point. Having a self-powered device, either by heat or sun, is crucial to have the energy independency at the individual level. This works in both, uh, especially in those countries where the energy independency is crucial. I totally agree with you. And there, are, there has been a lot of innovation and progress on the solar side, while the heat harvesting based technology is still in its uh, early birth. But I hope that also that technology can catch up. And at the end, we're going to have a hybrid, hybrid material that can harvest heat, solar and vibration. So what you said is a very important point. And I think must, uh, 
we innovators uh, and scientists, we have a huge responsibility in pushing the boundary forward in those directions. I'd be interested in hearing from the two people on this podcast that spent time living in the Middle East, specifically with this conflict in Syria. Do you see, is there some like specialness to it related to the religious conflict that's taking place there? Or is there anything else that you can share from your sort of more unique perspective, having lived close, closer to that area than any of us have? Well, I think alternative sources of um, order is always a good thing. I guess uh, when I picture the people in Syria, especially the new generation, when I see kids that are growing up seeing nothing but ISIS around them. So propaganda is a big thing. In the, those parts of the world, uh, it, there's lack of access to a lot of information resources so that people, if like one kid has a one glance at a Disney cartoon or animation for like five minutes it's gonna have like huge influence and impact on him that he's not gonna buy what like his uh, big brother is telling him that he needs to blow himself to go to heaven for a second he's like he gets two minds to think that he has other options in life that there's more to life than what he is being told so that i'm like thinking very extreme environments that are creating kind of extreme terrorists that like, in large population maybe they're not more than like three thousand in the on the whole planet but that's like the most concern because those are the big most problematic problems like those that 3000 is enough to like bring chaos to the whole region so i feel like the propaganda if in a way that we could sort of like diffuse into other people's space of information i don't know how really but i think that the social aspect of it how you can just get stuck in the bubble of consciousness through like very local and closed societies uh that's a thing what do you think i don't i don't really have a big opinion on it it's just a bit it's a vague idea in my mind well i guess that speaks to how important the internet really is for preventing conflict in the first place if that conflict is driven by ignorance whether it's religious ignorance or misunderstandings that more education or information or communication that's a really good point and i guess that speaks to giuseppe's Point that the internet is it's a driver of so much in our lives these days it's important to to think of it as a really basic need because I mean, if it's not there then people will stay in ignorance i mean the thing about the internet is that it makes information traveling much more efficient it's your fastest news source if it's about global news if it's about your friends or whatever so i think that's basically why we're so dependent or, or why we're consuming it so much because it will be the fastest channel but the thing is the information that is transported through the internet i mean we're talking right now about good cases and that's what Silicon Valley is very often talking about, about people, you know, like about education will cure everything. But also what you see is that, for example, ISIS is recruiting so many people. Most of the people are actually recruited through the internet. So, I mean, that's also crazy. And, and the question is, how will you control what behavior the internet or provision of internet will have in those countries? What do you think? Yeah, I think that it's a risk that perhaps is worth taking. I don't have numbers at hand, but I think that even though few ISIS terrorists recruit through internet but there are millions of people on the other side that can show their pain to us okay so it's it's a double side thing you're right and it's all about how can we uh, deal with the balance of those two things having internet empowering those people with the internet might have a huge effect on sensibilizing the western world for example if we have friends that are from those countries and we are able to see their pain we are most likely to help them but if you don't have friends for those countries if you don't see them it's very hard to even understand what's going on there right yeah. So this is also a problem. Sometimes we don't we don't help because we don't see. I know it's very hard to process. I mean, it's very hard to accept this. It's, it's in our new uh, human nature. Okay? And that's why I never wanted to go to those places even to help because I might be trapped with my guilt and I will never come back. So uh, I would love to help them. But with the internet, we can shorten the distance between them and us. It, yeah, it is worth pointing out that the secular trend over the past 200 years or over the course of human civilization has been fewer and fewer deaths. I shouldn't say over the course of human civilization. We had terrible conflicts in the 20th century, but it sort of reached a peak, I would say, after World War II. And it's empirically, we can see that it's declined in the number of deaths as a proportion of population due to conflict have declined every year since World War II. I 
could be slightly wrong on that statistic, but basically that's the case. And I wonder if a lot of that has to do with the greater availability of information, whether it's the internet or whether it's television. Just imagine something like World War I happening today. Like the media goes crazy if even one or two soldiers from a developed country get killed in an operation. Canada was driven to reduce its involvement in the conflict in Afghanistan because of a few dozen deaths. Can you imagine Australia committing its troops to the Gallipoli campaign, which in World War I killed thousands upon thousands of its soldiers in this vain attempt to capture like one muddy bank that led to Istanbul, like there's no way that would happen today, right? So I feel like the kinds of conflicts that could cause millions of people to die, maybe those at least are in our past because of information making it impossible to do that kind of thing. Now, conflict still exists today and we just need better and better communication to further that trend. I agree with you. I don't have the numbers at hand, but I heard from the from Bill Gates consumer recently and foundation has a reliable statistics on this trend he also was referring to death for uh trivial Ill- illness but yes so the trend is going down still there is a lot of things that can be done right and yeah so i'm just worried about this you know the fact that in certain areas only satellite communication works that empower only rich people to communicate with each other so this is also a problem that we have to face but anyway so it's just a side point and uh, but i totally agree with you on this i've heard similar stuff that are actually right now is that general well-being of the world population is now better than ever before but i wonder if how that statistics also just include like now curable diseases or treatable diseases which were not so so are you sure about the facts just regarding war i mean like do, do you think the major driver of this is really the internet that's my question because if, if yes i think it's a pretty cool implication that will get better with more internet yes i think internet is crucial honestly look at how it changed our society right and it's crucial because it allows us to eat them and vice versa so just think about north korea now if those people from north korea know what's going on here that we are free to achieve whatever we want those people would not go against the dictator <laughs> they would start to to talk to each other right and this is important Here's another question, because I also think that as a society or yeah. or in different societies that also the morals are kind of changing, you know, like what do you consider is good or bad or ethical? And how do you think the internet impacts that? Because I feel like that might be actually related. A culture's ethical viewpoints, I think, is something that really changes over time and is dependent on time. And yeah, that might be actually related because if, I don't know, 100 years ago, you'd have the internet, maybe people would, would be still like, oh yeah, just kill them. <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. No, I think that it was the absence of video of the front line that kept World War I going. If people could see the gory footage of their sons being killed in no man's land and just mowed down by machine guns as they try to do, you know, mass attacks on little hills in, in rural France, like there is no way the public mood would still remain on a war footing. I feel like every time there's a war, even in developed countries, there's a clampdown on information because they know that if find out about the, the terribleness of war, they're, they're not going to want to do it. There's a reason why two democracies have never gone to war and that's because it, you really need to restrict information to get people to be willing to die in that way can i say this though there's a two-edged sword here because the internet it's true has allowed people to communicate and share information in ways that have not been possible before but it's also made it possible for the state to control people's access to information and to shape their view of the world in unique and different ways today. People thought that China could never maintain its firewall because it would be too difficult. But as it's turned out, actually, they've been able to create this technology or to innovate and have this great internet wall of China that's kept its people from having full access to information. A billion people are unable to have unfettered access to information. And so what worries me is which trend is going to prevail in the future? Will it be a greater concentration of control over information like the Chinese model, where some people at the top will have ultimate control over what information people can share and disseminate? Or will it be an ultimately decentralized model where people have control and the state 
state really doesn't have control. And it seems like it can't really have both. It needs to be one or the other. And I honestly don't know which it will be. And just to say one last thing about that, it, it's really scary to imagine technologies that will make dictators impossible to topple. Like already they're testing robots that have guns, right? So if you can imagine an invincible robot army, you're not invincible, but if you can imagine a robot army that has guns and is loyal to Bashar Assad, like there's no way he could ever be toppled by the people because his troops are infinitely loyal to him. Considering about internet and the freedom through internet and the control factor from the state, I think the politics of it is so important. For example, if you have a tyrannical state, it doesn't matter if it's internet, if it's newspaper, there's always going to be oppression. There's always going to be lack of freedom. No matter if it's internet, they find the technology, they found a way to oppress people. So internet is just another tool it's it's another tool that can be manipulated or cannot so if there's a democracy that people have more freedom of access to resources then the factor that internet can control people it gets less less and less probable so the lawmaking is important how the lawmaking is taking place is it through democratic processes if for example it reminds me of that was a couple of years ago that was giving more bandwidth to netflix uh, in the u.s and a bunch of other businesses and it was rejected it was rejected and it did not decrease the freedom of internet because of how the democracy played its game right you know so uh, i think it's always an ongoing struggle between power how power is uh, shaped uh, through time and space so i don't think it's it's an intrinsic feature of internet either it can be stubborn or not to keep its freedom or not it's up to the people itself how they perceive the world how their beliefs are shaped and how much they think they need freedom to have and how much they think they need not to have freedom yeah just had a quick opinion from a professional here i was talking last week to somebody doing a phd in law theory and she's actually trying to figure out what changes do we need to consider in making laws for bringing politics to the internet official politics and government to the internet and she was saying that basically it all stays the same thing so kind of like agrees with what you're saying us so basically everything she's just like doing all the old stuff again like rationally argumenting from the from the ground principles the same principles and everything basically stays the same it just gets more efficient so maybe just to like have two or three more minutes on this what do you think will be the future of war will there be wars in i don't know 50 or 100 years and how do you think they will look like well, in a way, it's surprising that there's war today, given that we can now destroy the entire planet and turn the crust of the earth into hot magma. And yet for 50 years, people have still been prosecuting wars, just ones using conventional weapons. So it seems like technology has made war impossible for certain countries, but for others, it doesn't seem to have made that much difference. And that worries me. It makes me think that unless countries become sufficiently developed, they may continue to have the same sorts of conflicts that they've had over the last 50 years. Like I'm thinking about Africa, especially, but even in the Middle East as well. Hi guys, can you hear me? You sound fantastic. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great. So yes, I have a couple of thoughts. I wasn't able to say any of those. I could just listen. One of them is there is a disconnection. Yes, the, the reason we have internet is bringing the idea and sharing information together. But the problem exists right now that that centrality, it's example, we are not exposed to the information that is closer to us. So that's one of the issues that need to be addressed even with the internet because the information flows because a lot scattered that is really hard to figure what types or what type of event that can affect us. And we don't really understand the things that are not close to us. And then the other thoughts I had also based on what we discussed was that lots of information that we do have, they're not connected with the news channel, like especially like in emerging market or developing countries, because we do not have access or to those problems that those people face we cannot really understand those problems we don't can understand the evidence of those problems and then one of the things i was thinking about it it was how we can connect news channel to the firstly like how we can connect people in emerging market together or different places that they have they facing with similar 
issues and then how we can have the news channels on top of that that they can recognize the evidence that happening in other countries and emerging market then they can broadcast those news to the broader world or to the people are able to solve those problems I have the roadmap for that. I can kind of explain it um, later. Also, in terms of like internet connectivity, I guess you, there is many ways that we can resolve this issue, for example, by texting messages. Like if there is a greater network that people are connected, but there you, you can also connect your problems or your issues through the text messages. Also, that would be work. It shouldn't be necessarily in the format of internet, but you can transfer those into the that networks the other things also i was thinking about it was based on the technology policy that we discussed i was talking with one of the professor at miri institute miri is machine intelligence research institute and one of the concern he had that especially like uh, with the advancement in ai when we give goal to certain ai then for example we said the goal is to maximize for example paperclip right and if the goal is maximize paperclip then it, there's an infinity on maximizing paperclip and they don't know what types of resources or what would be the effects that would be happen in the other part of the world so one of the example also michael brought off like for example if terrorism they have for example access to that advanced goal centric tools then what would be the incentivizations of them and how much their resources could destroy the um, or countries discuss also about the how the incentivization it's really interesting to set up the, uh, the power but organizations we go to internet of thing now global network the power in many and, and that centric power it disable us to understanding the power into different places or like for example different locality or different networks and I think that language between that network is completely missing and how we can actually try to create the tools that the efficiency of that language between those networks and reduce the power in some sense. I'm talking really abstractly. I'm not too sure if neither of you follow, but those are my overall thoughts. Sorry, Parnian, you were muted. I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, cool. So. Let's just go to the show notes, the elevator pitch battle. In this elevator pitch battle, each of us will give one business idea in less than 30 seconds. Then we will each vote on the best idea. All right, let's begin. Round one, Michael. This weekend is the Thai New Year, Songkran, and many Buddhists pay 20 baht to release a fish into the river or a bird into the air. Setting a creature free is supposed to give them good karma, but I doubt such actions are more than marginally good for the environment mobile app where you pay a small price and click a button to release quote unquote a virtual bird or virtual fish but the money you donate goes to a real environmental organization that works to set aside real habitat for species now that would be real karma plus real convenience okay cool thanks for the idea round two daniel yeah i had various ideas actually i wanted to talk today about the idea that Parney sketched earlier about efficient information coming from war zones to first world. But another idea, so we want to calculate distances between you and other people on Facebook and other topics. Distances, not in terms of physical distances, but in terms of see yourself in a graph. So you can always decide what information you want to consume. Is it information that you've never heard of before? Is it information that you don't will not agree with? And this way ensures that you can have a complete, you know, 360 view on what is going on around you and not a bubble view. Okay, um, let's go on with round three. Daniel, can I just, so how is this different from say LinkedIn, which tells you how many degrees you are away from somebody else? I think the distance should be more calculated in terms of, you know, like Facebook, for example, learns what stuff you enjoy, what your political opinion is. And I think it will be more about, okay, here's a topic that you have never heard of, which maybe like will crush your, you know, like 
political views or something. Or here is the feed of a person that you totally disagrees with you. And I felt more in that direction. I totally didn't prepare a pitch, but that's... That is so that's creepy. Basically. That is so creepy. Imagine if Facebook and its algorithm could predict your opinion about a given news item before you even look at it, right? I'm sure it can do that right now. I'm sure it knows totally, yeah. some news, some political item, what your opinion is before you've even read it. Fascinating. I think that's already something that actually is in the back end, you know, implement that they have you ever considered to to look at your Google ad profile? It will say something like, Yeah, this is Michael, he's probably male, you know, twenty five years old. And I think Facebook knows this is much better than, than Google ads. Or actually maybe I don't know. But I yeah, I g I guess so, because you because of likes, you actually evaluate content in, instead of just searching for it. But I guess both would have a lot of information and enough to say how much you would know about a certain information or what you would think kind of an information. Yeah, Facebook knows all my preferences, but Google knows all my dirtiest, uh, darkest secrets. Uh, okay, that's a confession from Michael. Thanks for that. Let's go on with round three. Us. <laughs> that wasn't. Like... <laughs> Have you guys hear about Edward Snowden? I rec highly recommend watch the movie. You mean uh, Citizen Four? I think is Edward Snowden's documentary. Yes. Yes. I have not, but okay. No, definitely you need to watch. Cool. We should. All right. We should add a movie section. Oh, by the way, I also add. Uh, I was talking with Palantir, one of the guy in Palantir. One of the things they've discussed about, and also there is one person that it was actually designing the algorithm back end of the Facebook that she described to us how the Facebook categorize like lots of like opinion, and then they have like really understanding about who you are as the person, and then based on those category of you, then they figure out exactly okay what type of information that you can connect with what type of friends that they kind of create your friend zone based on that so you don't like if you have thousands of friends you only access to few of them that they are in your top like friend opinion are similar to you so they connect people with similarities and not differences and i guess one of the huge issue right now we do have because everything uh, every networks or all the things they try people connect with similarities and that connecting with similarities uh, distinguish many differences so we need to bring people with differences in our networks in order to be better informed and that's a huge problem that exists in our society right now and one of the things about the um the guy in palantir it was crazy like he was talking about all the information that the um, government they got from people and then all the actions item the government or tools that the government has in order to really recognize what's the society or like what's the target audience they, they follow all of your public or private information so. okay round three pause what if in the war zones in order to prevent the terrorists to actively engage in violence instead of dropping bombs at them to defuse their physical existence what if we could diffuse their minds by information propaganda using by dropping packets of cheap plastic made cell phones that they're wrapped in small balls and then when like thousands of them are dropped at their pole with random entertaining small cell phones that they have awakening information packed in these cheap cheaply made plastic cell phones could over time change their perspective toward the world and showing them alternatives that they could choose for their lives. Where's the business idea there? The money comes from donations. Okay, so it's a non-profit, but how, like, <laughs> what exact, you know, like, information would they get? I or think, how would you uh, figure some, that out? What, what yeah, level more abstract? Uh, how would you figure that out? Yeah, like, because here's how the idea was generated. Right now, those kind of groups, they have every resource to manipulate information from their top parts of the hierarchy. Uh, and the young people have no physical access to any source of alternative information. So the only way to crack to their system, to their intelligence system, is to drop things at them. So unfortunately, right now, what the only thing is dropped at those communities is bombs to just diffuse their physical existence so that they're not active anymore. What if we could diffuse their minds by dropping physical sources of information that have already recorded information that could, depending on the context, 
projects that is all consulted with the locals and their counterparts selectively chosen to what to show them to those people what can trigger their emotions towards choosing a better life choosing a better approach to life which is custom made based on each context certainly airdrop information is no it's it has a very long history in war the u.s dropped millions of leaflets or at least thousands of leaflets over Europe and over Japan during World War II. And this was done in many conflicts before that, I believe, too. However, cell phones, I think, gives the two-way communication and could potentially give people a better life in addition to that information that you're talking about. So way better than a leaflet and could be an yeah. interesting idea. But yeah, I think it would be more individualized through that because you can actually, through two-way communication, you could actually choose or people could figure out what to inform you about. Okay, but I feel like there's a lot to discuss here about cell phones, so I'll cut it off right now. Let's go on with round four, Carney. Okay, I have two ideas. One of them is I was thinking about information. So if uh, I'm not too sure about the feasibility of this idea, but if you have a software that is an intelligent software, tell people what type of resources around them they can use in order to protect themselves and build tools to protect themselves. So give order to people like what type of tools they can build. Give order to people like what type of resources they can use to better use the protection for themselves. It's kind of like instead of bringing technology, someone bringing technology to them, but we actually build a software that give order to people that enable them to build something for themselves. It's kind of a decentralized solution structure. The other idea I have, it's based on Michael's idea, which was about accelerator close to a uh, war zone. So if we get the top problems and then, then we expose those top problems to the technology providers that are relevant, so we can use kind of a networks that understand those type problems and connections between them, so we can provide better solutions for them leveraging technology. So, I mean, generally, there is no best, although we will, of course, choose one winner. Which one do you want to submit, Parni? First one. Okay. Usually, we'll go on with round five and Giuseppe, but I think he's already not among us anymore. Is that true? Right. Did you so guys understand the idea? Okay. Parni, can you give us a five-word summary of idea number one? It's an intelligence mind that gives us tools and resources to help protect ourselves. They tell us like what type of technology we can build based on our resources around us. Uh, I get it, like a MacGyver app. You can call it app or any different things, but a do it, a do it yourself MacGyver, MacGyver helper. Like I'm trying so to think of a way to. They can help you to build any things you want, any technology you want to protect yourself. So they figure out like you just submit your problems. And then those tools, they tell you all the resources that you require to use around you and people identify those people also that they can protect yourself. Like, for example, if you need that, tell you like how to build a house exactly, or if you need to make your water better or whatever, they tell you exactly what to do. Like kind of give is an intelligence, like super intelligence mind, tell you exactly what to do to protect yourself. You do make me realize how human survival is very much an information problem at, at root, isn't it? Because in almost any situation, if you have access to like an omniscient source of information that knows exactly what to do and prosper. So really all these material questions are subsidiary to the basic need for information about what to do. Yes, self city. Nice. Okay, let's quickly sum up the different ideas. First was Michael with the app to release virtual birds in order to donate. Second was Daniel with leveraging degrees of separation on political opinions. Third was Haas with air dropping cheap cell phones into war zones to selectively inform. And third was Parney using AI to help. Okay, so let's vote for the winner now. I think there's so many good ideas to vote and none of them is perfect, but which do we choose? Okay, the first thing is everyone needs to decide who they think is the winner and it can't be you. Everybody ready? Okay. Everybody got their opinion ready? I will count up one, two, three, and then basically on four, everybody will say, the name of the person they think should win okay okay one two three 
Pause. Parnian. Michael. 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 We have a winner. Two votes for Michael, one for Haas and one for Parney. So the winner of today is Michael. Thanks for the awesome time today. I had a really Yay. fun time discussing everything. For listening. See you next week. Thanks, everybody. This was really fun. I had a great time. Have a good day. Have a good night. Bye-bye. That was great, guys. I really enjoyed it. Goodbye.